understand that to uh, insist on sitting in the back uh, can't hear the speaker. Well, in future, you should be able to. So, there we go. Pardon? Yes. There's always got to be a comedian up there. Now, you know, I'm glad you could all make it this afternoon, because it is the glorious 12th. I thought you'd, you'd all be out crowd shooting. But, uh, obviously, um, obviously, that's not the case. Uh, this afternoon, uh, the gentleman who's going to talk to us uh, is not Harry Thomas from Press Starting. Uh, Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not Harry. It's Howard, and he's come via Scarborough and America uh, to Bridwell. So, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's had quite a, quite a journey. The day, that, uh, the day that I found him was what I called an international day because um, I was given Howard's contact details, and I tried to, and I got an email reply from the United States of America, which bothered me a little. I thought he's going to, I thought he's going to be expensive. <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, it transpired he was on holiday there. And then I made another telephone call to the guy that uh, looks after my um, computer and things like that. Uh, and I said, hey Leon, how are you today? He said, I'm fine. He said, um, um, where, where was he? Where's Bulgaria. Bulgaria. He was in Bulgaria. <laughs> very, very international day, you know. <laughs> then I found somebody else, and I found them at home in Ridland, so I, uh, I felt, uh, I felt more confident then. But hey ho, uh, what have I got to tell you? Uh, Glorious twelve. We've done that. No cars. Uh, I did mention those in the update. Uh, we have them. But they're not here today. There is a, an example at the back that you can, uh, you can have a look at. They're in packs of eight, um, four pictures, um, two of each. So you've got eight in a pack. And we think they'll work out at about four pounds a pack. They're pictures of his, historical pictures of Ridge Lab. So, uh, we thought that would be different. We're also going to do the calendar. Um, that should be available for October. The note cards will be available next month. So there we are. So without further ado, we'll hand over to Howard, um, all the way from Scarborough by the United States, and he's landed here, and he's managed to find a car parking space, which is quite clever as well. And he's also got to wrestle with this um, lapel microphone. So uh, best of luck. Thank you very much. Bingo! How about that? Okay. I want to ask you first, this is, this is a long story, the story of two meters, stone, stone two meters. It goes back such a long, long way that it's really difficult to get the head around how old it is. It's the longest lived technology that man will ever know. It goes back, that we know of, two million years. Now, those were the first, they were, were homo sapiens. Now the first two makers were homo sapiens, but I'll tell you what they were as we go through. Now, we all, we've all picked up stones in our life, haven't we? We're in the garden, or whether you're on the beach, or you see a stone, you think, oh, and you pick it up. Sometimes you put it in your pocket, sometimes you take it home. And they often finish up like a long mountain piece on your bedside cabinet. And there's no reason for that. But we've all done it. I'm sure most of you here have done it at some time in your life. So, to go back, and you're not supposed to switch it on. This thing is She was born on February the 6th in 1913. 
in London. Uh, to the Nicholl family, the father was Edward Nicholl, and the mother was Cecilia. She was a bit of a character. She grew up very much a character. And uh, when they were seven years old, they moved to France. And uh, she learned the language. And her father had travelled the world painting. He'd gone to Italy, Egypt. He was a watercolour artist and an oil artist uh, and Italy. And his, uh, his works were brought back to Britain and sold. So they were quite well to do. Moved to France. She developed an interest in archaeology because of her father's interest when he visited Egypt. So they, were, they went to Les Aziz, which is in the Dardogne area. And even at that tender age, she befriended a local guy called Eli Peroni. And he was excavating uh, local caves. And she got involved and she was fascinated with it. And uh, she got permission eventually. He was a bit of a, he was a, bit of a treasure hunter, was, uh, was Eli Peroni. And he wasn't doing everything thorough. So she got permission to go through all the excavated soil and dirt and rubble that he pulled out of these uh, caves. So she could go through it and she went through it meticulously. And she was, so she was only 12 years old. And she started to draw and she picked up artistry from her father. And she was a great illustrator. And she illustrated the flints that she found. Now when I say the flints, these were tiny little tools. Now, stone tools are made from mainly flint, sometimes uh, volcanic glass. But it's, you can only make stone tools by chipping away with a hand stone. Anyway, she, she, got, she was uh, classifying these little artifacts that she found. And then all of a sudden, 12 years old, her father dies, so they come back to Britain. Came back to Britain, and uh, without, without a dad, and needing an education, and mother put her in a convent. Um, she got expelled from the convent because she wouldn't recite uh, French poetry, although she was fluent in French. So she was put in another, into another convent, and she got expelled again because she uh, caused an explosion in the Lombardian side. <laughs> but anyway, she started to educate herself. And although she wasn't a member of any university, she managed to get in to listen to lectures on archaeology. And as a result of that, and her illustrative genius, Morton Wheeler found out about her. And you probably remember Morton Wheeler from uh, the television many years ago. He was a well known archaeologist. And he invited her to go work, which she did. And as the years passed, she was doing more and more illustrations. And then the great Louis Leakey, who was working out in northern Tanzania, found out about her. And he invited her to go to northern Tanzania, to the Old Dubai Gorge. And the Old Dubai Gorge is about 30 miles long, 12 miles wide. And Louis Leakey was excavating in that area, looking for very early evidence of hominids. Hominids are upright, upright walkers. So we're homo sapiens, hominids, there's different when you go way back. And I'll explain what they were here at all the bike gorge. And this is what it looked like. This is a topography. Over millions of years, hundreds of thousands and millions of years, the earth, the, the, the climate ch had changed the topography. It had been flooded, that it was rivers, it was dry, volcanic activity, a move, earth movement. And she was excavating here in this area on this cliffs. And within months of her being there, she was finding bones and, and small tools. Now they weren't flakes. They were black basalt. 
and then that she knew these had been worked. And you can see from the flakes, all flakes take off. That doesn't occur naturally. So she knew that the hand of man, or some kind of man, had affected the shape of this. And it was actually being classified as a chopper core. So you could actually chop stuff up with it. As I say, it's not flint. It's black basalt, which was taken there by Homo habilis. And this is a skull art, obviously. Homo habilis was about four foot six tall, but he was an upright walker. Quite gracile, quite small in stature. They weren't hunters, they were scavengers. They weren't big enough to be hunters. And they were scavengers at, at big kills, that bigger beasts than animals have killed. And this is the artist's impression of what we might look for. Uh, but as I say, they had a, a smaller spray, uh, but had the capability of making, making an attempt at making a small tool. A million years later, now jumped, that's an enormous jump, a million years, nearly a million years, to about 800,000 to a million years BC, Homo erectus came along. <coughs> this is the male, this is the female. Social occasions must have been really confusing. But they, in turn, were two makers again to make it have got more sophisticated than what they were making with these. Now that's three views of one tool. And it's called an Acunian hand axe. Flakes have been removed from both sides. Now you can remove the flake from a piece of flint with a stone that's hard enough and round enough to smack to smack the flake and remove the flake. You can also remove the flake with a soft hammer, and that's an antler from a red deer. And if you use a red deer antler, you'll get thinner flakes and a finer finish. And the reason they're called the Cunian hand axe was because they were first found, first evidence of them was in saint Cure, not far from Paris. We're going to move on again now from a million years we're going to move forward. I'll try and keep a continuity for you so I don't jump about all over the place. Boxgrove is near Chichester. This is Chichester Harbour just here. So it's just a few miles up north. Boxgrove Pirate is quite famous. Now in 1984, at Boxgrove, a, a roadstone were uh, removing gravel from a large quarry. A young man called Mark Roberts was employed there. He was only 18 or 19 to, uh, to look for Roman remains. Now I'm going back again. I'm going back looking at this. About 400,000 years at Box Road, there were chalk cliffs fresh water and it was by the sea. And this is an artist's impression what it be, might have been like four to five hundred thousand years ago. Today, well it's been covered in now in 1984 to so 1990, it was like this, they were excavating. Mark Roberts, and whilst he was looking for Roman remains, had actually found flints. He was studying archaeology. He was only 19 years old. He was studying archaeology and he, uh, he thought, well, there's a lot more to this site than meets the eye. So he got permission to excavate. He's a bit older, this is Mark, and he's a bit older here. But he got permission to excavate it properly. And you can see how far they've got down there. Um, the cliffs that he rolled in and he rolled in. And it had all flattened, not flattened out, but gone into a long slope. And they've dug into that slope. Uh, 
and, and they discovered tools, stone tools and flakes. And you can see the stone tools there on the floor, in situ. That's what they call a working floor. And they can date it back, because they can date it by carbon, uh, carbon testing it. They can date, date it back to 475,000 years. So that's two ice ages ago. And uh, there were hominids there, upright walkers, making stone tools. And these upright walkers, were called Homo heidelbergensis, and that is before Homo neanderthalis, in the region of 400,000 to 650,000 years ago. So this, this picture was taken about 1996 as they excavated. That's a good example, and that is one of the tools they brought up of the excavation. There were 314 all handbooks. And apart from all the debitards, which were the flint flakes that were there, that they don't use as tools. And they were making these because when you've killed a large beast, a large animal, you can't carry it away. So you've got to cut it up. And the way to cut it up, especially the joints, you can use a heavy tool with two sharp edges to drive into the joint and disconnect it so you can carry it away. Now these 314 hand axes wouldn't have been made all at the same time. They would have been visiting this site probably every springtime. When the animals were there, when the young were there, because the young were easy to kill and easy to carry away. Uh, because the animals would be there for the grass and the fresh water. This is an example of one of the actual hand axes that they, that they found there. And you can see, just one second, this flake here, that's been removed there, was struck just there, just on that piece there. And it's called a transient flake, because when, when you strike it there, on that edge, and the flake flies off, flies off that way. It leaves that edge there, razor sharp. That's about seven centimetres, it might be seven centimetres wide and about eleven long. So you can hold it in your hand and you've got a cutting edge there. And they are razor sharp and they're wonderful for cutting meat. Um, there was an experiment done called the Mitchell Experiment in London in the 1970s when some archaeologists approached a butcher and gave him a stone tool and asked him to use it instead of his knives. And he, he laughed at it first and he said, No, have a go with it. And they, they left him a week. And when they went back to ask him how it went, he said, I don't want my knives back. It's far, far better. And the reason for that is you've got, you've got, sorry, you've got a scroll on the table. In cup, that long edge and it's curved. So all you have to do is turn it in your hand rather than rub your arm up and down. You can just turn it in your hand. So it's very, very efficient for putting me. Homo hypogensis, the skull. <coughs> now, there are very, very few remains, I think three or four throughout the world, of Homo hypogensis. One is a tibia, which I'll show you in a bit, and this is the skull, which was found in Swanscombe in, in West Kent, uh, in three parts, and it's an amazing, amazing story. The three pieces of the skull, one, was, one piece was found in 1925 in a quarry called Barnum the second piece was found 10 years later in 1935 and the third piece was found in 1955. So over 30 years it took to find that skull. This is what we assume Homo Barbagensis look like. This is the tibia. 
Now the tibia was found at Boxgrove in the quarry where they were excavating. And it was found by a guy called Roger Pedersen. He'd been working with Mark Roberts, Roger Pedersen, and Simon Parfit. <coughs> they are all giants in their field now of archaeology. Simon Parfit being a bone expert. But they were all working as young men, all studying, all on that same site in 1994-95. And Roger Pedersen was there on his own one night, on September night, and it was getting up to half past eight in the evening. And he had a bicycle, and he was thinking, and he was on his own excavating, and he was thinking, I'm going to have to go because I'm no lights on my bike. And as he was thinking that, his treble hit this. Now it was all crusted up, and it was in two pieces because you can see where it's uh, glued together there in the centre. And it was glued together with new glue glue all those years ago. Now, this, this was a world changing find. This was, this was international news. Um, and they let the news slip uh, a little bit early because they were that excited. Um, but still today, it's only one of three of the I'll be It's the skull, that, and a jaw, which I'll tell you about in a bit. And there are the three, there's the three. Uh, well, no, it's the skull and the jaw, but not the bone out. I don't know who painted this, but obviously an artist impressive of home out of this. And the spear is quite relevant, which I'll talk about in a bit. Now on the site, on the uh, Oxgrove site where they were excavating and they found the, the tibia, they also found a few teeth. And on those teeth there were scratch marks, and they were front teeth. So they knew they were using the team as a third hand. Where they put the nail, for whatever reason, in the mouth, holding the team, and then cut it with, with flint tools, because the flint had scratched their own teeth. This is a horse shoulder blade. To start with this family, and the modelers made it up to the full size. But the hole was made by a spear like that. They don't have stone tips. They're quite thick, they're quite heavy, and they're quite long. They are about the size of a javelin, a modern javelin, and made in the same way. So there it grew, they were hunting, and they were hunting horses, we know they were hunting. Now this is a spear, it's one of ten that were found in Germany, in Schoenig. Uh, they were found in the late, in the mid-1990s. Uh, one was spruce and the others, all the others were pine. And they were found uh, in a lignite mine, where they were open cast mine. And the lignite is like a cheap brown coal. And the family is with with uh, several stone tools, but um, I can't find out what the stone tools were, but I'm gathering the would be hand axes. This is a lady at the museum, uh, handling one of them. They've been under pressure, so they've got deformed, but you can see the size of them. Uh, they could be used as a chronic weapon or for throwing. Now, they remade, the, the, uh, the archaeologists commissioned somebody to make modern ones to the same specification. And then they got some Olympic athletes to throw them and they behaved in a very similar manner to a modern javelin. When they were making them, I mean, in the old uh, 400,000 years ago, when they made them originally, they were made so they were slightly heavier at one end. So if you try to balance it on your finger, you have to go two thirds down it to get it to balance. And that will make it fly straight when it's through. So if we come forward again, so we're about 400,000 years, as I say, 4 to 500,000 years. All the Neanderthalis came along about 300,000 years ago. And it's very, very likely that they're cohabited. 
and, and maybe, you know, uh, just mix together and produce their own project is quite likely because they did with us, we're homo sapiens, and they, they, they did, they bred with us because we all have three to four percent DNA in us of the end of the DNA. I know it looks a little bit twig, but I'm sure it was a formidable thought. Now they in turn had a different way of making stone tools. They would take a piece of flint and they'd shape a piece of flint by knocking flakes off side to side. And when they got the desired shape, they would strike it off at the top there. So they were removed. So it was they knew. It was a predetermined size. And these were called Mosterian, Mosterian tools. And the reason they're called Mosterian is because they were yet to get into plants who were found in Mosteria, the first one that found in Mosteria. And the technique for doing it, for making them, is called the Lavalois technique because Mr. Lavalois <coughs> was the global word to call that. And this is an example of. Um, tools, plates removed, one there, one there, and then struck from the top to make it more. So although it, it had moved on, the technology had moved on, I'm sure nobody, no individual would have recognized any change at any time because it was always such a huge, huge length of time. Now this is a cave very local to us. This is Pont Newth Cave, and you might have heard of this. It's on the River Elby, southwest of St. Asaph, about eight or nine miles southwest. And these lads were excavating in, uh, in 1978. It didn't look like a cave. You couldn't see the entrance. All you could see was the outline of the entrance, because it was packed with a matrix of soil and, and rock. So they had to take the lot out, and all that was pushed in by the last day stage, by the river rising and falling and pushing it all in. Now, this goes back 200, 278 to 300,000 years, and they found a tooth in it, well, two teeth, these two, which they, uh, they know to be the Homo Neanderthalus. About an 11 year old boy, because the pulp in the teeth is a bigger pulp cavity than we have, so that's how they're able to identify it. This was a, a curious hand axe made by uh, all of the other This one came out of the cave. So we're going to move on again now. In two to three hundred thousand years, the other time, to Homo sapiens. And we're coming up to about 40,000 years, which is still a long time ago. And, and they developed blade technology. And as you can see from the shape of these blades, and you can remove blades by striking. Take the top off first with the nodule, so you've got the flat edge. And then you put a piece of antler, an antler tip on the top, and you hammer it and it bangs the flake off of a predetermined size. And the, the edges of those flakes are razor sharp. This is an example of how good we were at it. This is a piece of what called Texas flint. It's a slightly different colour, a sandy colour. You can see them. The outside's always a little bit different colour. But you can see the number of blades that we've been able to remove here. <coughs> and they, make, they can make all kinds of cutting tools out of that. So that was 30, 40 thousand years ago. And we're rapidly moving forward now to about 10,000, 10,000 BC. 
this is the time of this called the Mesolithic or the Mesolithic, which is the Middle Stone Age. Now all the mammoths have gone for 10,000 BC, we weren't killing large animals. It was only small stuff we were hunting. So we were using it. small flakes, we call them microliths. The principle is the same of taking long slivers off. And that itself is called a flint core. And that microlith has been removed from there. Now what you can do with that is make composite tools. We'll just digress for a second. I put this in because this has nothing to do with microliths. But you can see the bit of the uh, serrations on that. That's what you can do with them. You can make a saw. This is probably 20,000 years old and it was found in the Sahara. Back to where we were. So, making a sharp edge, having a cutting tool, absolutely essential. It's, the, it's why we're all here today, that we, we were able to thrive and survive. So these two pictures here, you might not be able to read that what it says, but one is a piece of obsidian, and obsidian is a volcanic rock. It doesn't occur here in this country, but it occurs a lot in the States. And when you flake a piece off, it flakes to the molecule, and it will cut through a human cell. And eye surgeons still like to use obsidian flakes because the cleaner the cut, the better the healing. Now one of them is a piece of obsidian, and one of them is a surgeon's scalpel. And believe it or not, sorry, believe it or not, that's the piece of obsidian. And that is the surgeon's scalpel. It shows you we can't make anything as good as nature can produce in this particular case anyway. So, I'm going to go to South Wales. Anyone recognise this? It's, the, it's on the Gallup Peninsula. And it's, uh, it's near Australia. <laughs> it's called the Goat's Hole Cave, which is another bit. It's not really decent, is it? But in 1923, the local vicar near Australia and his own case were in that cave. I don't know what they were doing, in fact, I'm not sure whether it's a view from it or not. <laughs> but it, they, they found bits of flint, and it came to the knowledge of a guy called William Buckland, who was the dean of Oxford University. So, the next year, eight, did I say 1924? It was 18, 1823. In 1824, William Buckland came down went into the cave, excavated it, and he found the remains of a body, no skull, but with the body were what he called ivory wands. They were about two feet long, uh, sticks of ivory. There were two of them. It was part of a, a skull, uh, not an earthy, an earthy god. Um, part of uh, uh, um, early mammoth skull, early, not the elephant, what do you call them? Mammoth. Mammoth. Part of a mammoth skull. And, uh, and there were perforated bees. And they thought, initially, they thought, well, they thought it was a Roman prostitute, they thought it was a woman, because she was covered in red ochre. Um, and the reason they thought it may be a Roman prostitute was they didn't want to go back too many years because in those days they didn't actually believe that the earth was any longer than 3,000 years old anyway. Um, but in the 60s and 70s, the bones were re examined. And they were that of a, a young male, probably around about 26 years old. And that's what we put yesterday. And uh, the burial was dated back to 29,000 years. 
Now that's at the time of close off the end of the last ice age, not far off. And you can see from the background there, that's land. Because at the time, 29,000 years ago, the sea was about 15 miles away, whereas it actually lacks up at the bottom of the, of the cave now. So that was 29,000 years ago. There's very little, very few remains uh, uh, around the country that have been dated. So the few are far between. But we're going to Scarborough because I lived there for 30 years and very, very close to me was one of the finest Mesolithic sites in Europe. And when they excavated it, it's all below peat, it's all covered in peat. It was an ancient, ancient place of the lake. And he excavated it in 1945 and then again in 1978. And what they found was all this like water work and, log, and logs laid out. Now, they don't know whether it was a platform on the lake or whether it was a collapsed house. They're not sure. But either way, the site was, uh, was a resident site for hunter gatherers who lived all over that area that we know now. And this is what they looked like because they were homo sapiens just like us. <coughs> and they used composite tools, flints, put into uh, put into shafts so you could make a spear. And they wanted fowl ducks, geese, deer. Um, the deer still breeding on that very site 10,000 years later. Uh, I've visited the site several times because I used to make uh, silver birch sap wine and uh, I got permission of the farmer to go and tap the trees to make the wine. And it was when I was there that I saw all the young deer and the farmer told me at the time, don't tell anybody you're down here, because if you find out, they'll be down here with lurches and booms to kill the deer. So, deer stay on the, same, on the same paths for thousands and thousands of years. So they were making tools from small cores like this. And you can see the, little, the fine flakes that have been taken off. As I say, they're called microliths. Small tools, small weapons, small game. And you get an idea of how big they are. They're not somebody's finger. And this is how they made the tools. Taking the, uh, taking the small face and inserting them in so you can make a spear. And they, they do a lot of damage. And, and this is not a brush, this is a flake. Here, and that's the sharp edge. And the reason they did and that's the end of a, an arrow. And the reason they did it like that was if the shooting end, if, if the, I know it sounds gruesome, but the size of that going into the flesh does a lot of damage, so they're more likely to bleed to death. So you can track them as they die. Um, more examples here of the small flakes. And once, when you find these on a site, you know that it was massively or likely to be. That's actually found, that's actually one that was found on the site, and they've, they've just made the pieces white so you can see them more clearly, because you, they were more or less the same colour as the wood originally. So, they were great engineers of what they did. These are bone with serrations in, used as fishing spears. These were all found on the side. And this is a little scraper, what we call a thumb scraper. It's only about two inches across in diameter. But you can see, sorry, you can see these little flakes here. Those have been pushed off, not hammered off, 
The push dot bar facing an angular tie with a sharp part of an angular, pushing, pressing on the edge and pushing it off. It takes a lot of pressure to make the shapes and when it does it leaves a sharp edge. And that's known as a thumb scraper. And you can scrape bark, make arrows, uh, scrape leather, scrape the fat off leather when you're tanning leather. So many, many of them were used. On this site, we found 21 of these uh, red deer, uh, not red deer, road deer antler, still attached to the skull. And these holes here weren't the eyes, the eyes were down here. They were deliberately made so they could thread corn through and they wore them on their heads. There's controversy as to, or there's a debate whether they wore them. A ceremonial basis, or whether they wore them, so they could, as a hunting strategy, so they could get amongst them. And, and my my belief is they wore them probably for both, but mainly for hunting, because you can group amongst the deer with one of them on and leather over your back, so you can be hidden. That was ten thousand years BC coming forward again now to about 3,500 BC to 4,000 BC, which is the Neolithic, this is the new Stone Age. And it's now, we're not only making tools out of flint, we're making them out of stone as well. Um, so the new Neolithic, the Neolithic was when we started to, we started to farm rather than hunt for our game and our life, our life it was. We start to farm, fence off the animals, because that way you've got a more predictable future. But interestingly, you've got a more predictable future, but it's much, much harder work to farm than it is to hunt and gather. You work much, much longer hours. Uh, sorry. This stone tool here is a polished hand axe made from stone. Another one, two more that have been drilled to, to be hafted. That would be hafted but wrapped with uh, leather, leather wrapping to hold it. That would be shafted. Another polished one. And one that's not polished. Now, if you polish a stone axe, it lasts longer than an unpolished one. Because all these all these scratches, well they're not scratches, all where the flakes will be removed, the rough surface. When you're hammering something, when you're chopping something down, the shock wave travels through it, and the rough surface encourages the shock wave to dive out of the side of it and hence break it or, or break it up, split it. But if you polish it, it will last longer. Mm. Um, but polishing, to polish that there would have taken hours, probably a week. Maybe a week either side, it was just a nightmare, a long, long job. I put this, this in, uh, this is Neolithic, you score your family in the Thames, it's a piece of flint, it's about two inches, three inches across, about three inches tall, but you can see it's being flaked around the edge, but it's also being polished around the edge, it's being ground, I should say, around the edge. Because you have that long cutting edge, which you put in your palm of your hand, and it's a wonderful serviceable tool. Back to the mix up experiment again, because you need. Um, I'll put this picture in because it gives you uh, an idea of how they have to uh, an axe that would be polished. Uh, this was uh, this is was in Norway or Sweden, I think, and it was found in the ground. Probably left there above the burial as a, a ceremony, ceremonial piece. But they were quite good at what they were doing, actual way they packing stuff and making it look good and serviceable. So in the new they needed they needed a lot of flint and a lot of stone because they traded it, they travelled all over Britain. And this is a place called Grimes Graves. They're not graves. They're dimples in the ground, large ones, 
when they dug pits. It's all chalk. This is all chalk. But in the chalk is the flint. And the flint only, only, you only find it in chalk. It takes 300 million years to form flint. And they think, and it's 99%, 98% silicon. And they think it is the silicon under the rainwater which permeates through the chalk and occupies the bodies of ancient, ancient sea creatures. And of course that forms flint nodules. So in the Neolithic they took these pits, they're about 50 to 60 feet deep. There are three layers of flint. One there, one there, and one back at the bottom. And the bottom flint is the best flint. It's nearly black and it's lenticular. It's not in modules, it's in a solid bed. So they were after that. And they were very, very sophisticated about getting it. This is inside. I've been down here. I've been down here. And uh, it's amazing. They were intelligent enough to leave pillars to hold the roof up so it wouldn't collapse. Mm. And when I went down there, it's about 20 years ago. There was water down there waiting for us all, the party that was well. And there was an anther, a large red deer anther lying on the floor. And I said to him, have you put that there for the visitors? He said, no. That's been here 5,000 years. And there were others as well. It was left as if they'd been there the day before. Astonishing really. <coughs> And that's just an idea of what we were doing, how we were getting it out. I mean, you've got to bear in mind that the chalk is soft and you can get the nodules out. Now, the nodules travelled all over Britain and there were flint knockers all over Britain in the Neolithic, making tools, making quite sophisticated tools. I put this picture in because this reminds me this is more to the Bronze Age. And um, so that's just a reminder for me, and that's a guy smelting some uh, copper. So back to the well actually the Bronze Age, nearly they coming into the Bronze Age. That's what we call a hammer axe. And that was found in Abergavenny in the 1990s, early 1990s, by a friend of mine who was an apprentice builder at the time. And I think he was on Castle Lane. I think he's called Castle Lane in Abergavenny. He was only a young lad. He was renovating a cottage, helping to renovate a cottage. He had to go for a week. He went to the outside toilet, and that was holding the door. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's incredible, but it, even as a young guy, he saw it and thought, "My God, what's that?" So he picked up and asked, asked, "Could he take it?" And he said, "Yeah." And he took it to be examined um, by the archaeologist that I was at. He went down to Cardiff. Um, it was found originally, they found out to inquire if it had been found by a lad called somebody, Ian Roberts, I think, uh, on his farm. He just found it on his farm in the field. He plowed it off. And then he got transferred to uh, behind the door. Um, they tested it. They took a little piece out of here. And uh, they could identify it as a rock from key of interest. Now, it hasn't weathered like that. Oops, crazy. Sorry. I will get used to this. It hasn't weathered like that with inputs. That's deliberate. Mm. Now, the reason they did that was because of this end. You can't see it in this picture. But it, it's not symmetrical. It's got a slight imperfection there that's just a dint. Now, it was originally, they polished it to get it like that. But because it didn't look great, it didn't look too good with that dint in. They disguised that dint, which you can't see if you if you dimple it, if you peck it, if you go all over it with a stone and rough it up. And that's exactly what they did. Because they, were, they liked the way things looked. It had to look good. Now you can see where it's been drilled the hole. That's filled with a stick and sand and water. 
and then the journey home and the drug on the other side to get through it. It takes days to do it. Now, it weighs about nine and a half pounds, that, about that, the weight of a house strip, a wet house strip. And when I handled it, I thought, oh, yeah, you couldn't use this sideways, you could only use it perpendicularly. So I realized straight away, it's for knocking posts in and for splitting wood. That's why, and you need posts and you need to split wood when you, when you farm it. So I'm coming right up to the present day now. I'm going to go across to California, Southern California, in 1911, in a place called Orwell. Do you remember the fires in California a couple of years ago? A few years ago? One of the places that was destroyed was called Orwell. Now this guy is the very, very last of his breed. He's the last of the Yahi tribe. And his name is Ishi. And Ishi means man. Because the Yahi tribe, you cannot speak your own name unless somebody refers to you by name. That's their tradition. Now he appeared on a farm where they'd been, uh, they'd been pulling some cattle and they had a small avatar at the back of the farm. Just, just almost 112 years ago from today, on the 11th of August, he appeared one night dressed like that because that photograph was taken like that. His tribe had been slaughtered. He survived with his mother and his sister for 40 years. They had been decimated by the whites and they'd hidden in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. So when he was, he was captured, taken by the local sheriff for his own protection, he was starving. He was looking for something to eat. As you can see, there's nothing on his feet. He's dressed in rags. Now he's taken to the local uh, sheriff's office, locked up. News got out, the newspapers found out about it. And it came to the attention of a book called Otto Schopenstack, wonderful name, isn't it? and he was the, uh, the professor of anthropology at Berkeley University. So he went straight over there as soon as he could with his assistant, a bloke called T.T. Waterman. And uh, to put a long story short, they took him in to their care, to the university, and they fed him, tried to, tried to uh, find somebody who could speak his language, which was very, very difficult, but they found somebody who spoke a similar language so they could communicate with him. And that's when they asked him what his name was, and he said, is she? And the interpreter said, that means man. This is Ishi, about 12 months later, same guy. This is Professor Oh, uh, uh, Staff. Sorry, I got the name wrong. His name is uh, Kroger, Alfred Kroger. And this is T.T. Walton. He was with him. He was at the university for oh, five years. Um, he was employed as a janitor, but he was also employed giving demonstrations of flint napping and, and tool making, leather working, stitching, all the stone age skills. He had everything. And because he was a man in two worlds, or had been in two worlds, he said he, he could, he could uh, relate the world he lived in and grown up in. The, the way they got through life, the way they did it, a modern man. And he said, presumably, that modern man is clever but not wise. <laughs> now, he was making, I put this picture on because he was making, uh, demonstrating how to make flint arrowheads, but not from flint, from glass. And this is an insulator from uh, 
It's how they grow quiet. You can see that. They can be different colours. But that colour, that colour, when it's made into a, an hour head, it's very attractive. If you're into that kind of thing. Um, but what they, what they were doing, what this tribe were doing, and other tribes were doing, when they uh, telegraphed men and installed these across, across the countryside, they were climbing up and breaking them off. The natives were climbing up and breaking them off. So what the, uh, the utility guys decided to do was every time they put a telegraph ball up, um, or a phone line or whatever, they would put two spares at the bottom, just so they could take them away. <laughs> Which they did. This is a stick with an in it, and it's called an issy stick. And, and the nail, you hold it, in your hand and under your arm and you push little flakes off to make an arrow head. And this is an arrow head that is she made from one of those insulators. That one sold, or oh, it's about six, seven years ago now, it sold for $27,000 because is she made it. There is a book called Is in Two Worlds and it's well, well, well it's the story of Ishii, his life, and it's written by Alfred Kroger's wife. Uh, an amazing book. So we've come full circle. Um, Mary Linky, she was refused a degree because she couldn't get an after getting in Oxford. But in 1951, because of her work throughout her life, she was so well recognised. Oxford University gave her an honorary degree and she got many of us from many of the universities around the world. Um, and when I asked you earlier on about picking up stones, we all do it. I am sure it's in our DNA, it's in our instinct to do that because we're still looking for tools. We can't find it seems.
Pardon? The first. The first. Oh, I've got that one. That's a good one. Don't come on the third, come on the first. <laughs> so it's September the first. I was probably looking at next year's calendar because that's what I'm doing for the History Society. So there we go. Um, we'll do the raffle. Um, well, I'm not going to do it. It'll, uh, they'll think it's a fix if I win. Not that I very often do.